Hi, this is Amanda with Beyond the Surface Virtual Wellness Center, and this is our two-part series, mini kind of workshop, um, mini coaching session with me on deconstructing religion and understanding adverse religious experiences and religious trauma. Now, if you are watching this on YouTube or any other social media website or platform, you can go ahead and purchase the whole workshop with um, worksheets and more commentary and guidance from me at beyondthesurfacewellness.com. So thank you so much for joining today. I'm very, very excited to begin this journey with you. Whether you are coming from a place of just starting to question the beliefs that you grew up with, or if you are fully already leaving the church or have left the church, or if you just know somebody who is, or you realize that this is happening a lot, um, I welcome you. And I'm so glad you're here. And I'm so excited to walk through this uh, journey with you and give you a really solid um, foundation. So this is an overview of these subjects. So I'm not can um, work together and you can um, get a coaching session with me at my website, Beyond the Surface Wellness. And otherwise, this is going to be you for you to just kind of um, get a little better understanding and start that journey of, of deconstructing, which does not mean that you are being deconverted. A lot of people deconstruct and, and stay within their same belief systems with just a different view of it and a different understanding of what's important to them. And then there are a lot of people who choose to completely walk away from high control religion or whatever religious background or belief system that they have grown up with. So let's start on this journey together. This is really a journey of helping you break down all those layers, all those conditioning thoughts, all the programming, and really find what resonates with you. And this is a great starting off point. So I really encourage So before we get into the heavy stuff, I would like to share this quote with you. Don't be afraid to become someone new. You owe no one an explanation as to why you've chosen to see yourself in a different light at whatever point your life might be in. Who do you want to be right now? Be that person. Feel free to is what is high control religion. And it says high control or high demand, high control religion is a faith community that requires obedience, discourages its members from questioning its rules, principles, <clears throat> and practices, expects subservience and loyalty discourages trusting relationships outside the group, perpetuates the notion that those within the group are right and superior to those outside of the group. It promotes extreme or polarizing beliefs and expects its members to suppress their authentic selves in exchange for the sense of belonging and security that the group offers. And I think that this is something that we are seeing across the board as people are reevaluating what religion is, why we believe in the religious belief systems that we do or faith systems. And um, one of the things that's so hard is it's such a group mentality, especially in the high control religion I came from. I came from fundamental evangelical Christianity in America. It really, really, and really uh, tries to divide and separate and isolate. So all of these things that is that are on this definition applied to me in my life to varying degrees, but all of our journeys are different. And I hope that as you read through this stuff, that some of this will resonate and that you'll start seeing the programming and conditioning that you were um, exposed to. In the slide, we are going to talk about two different images. And the first one says, things religion taught as godly that are actually unhealthy. So um, the first one says, your inner authority is not to be trusted. And this is something I really struggled with, and I'm sure it resonates with a lot of you, is that that little voice in your head that kept saying, like, I don't know, something just doesn't seem right. There's got to be something more to this. Or I don't understand why they're preaching this, but behaving like this. Or I don't understand how an all-loving God could have people burn in hell for eternity for 
finite sins. And we have those little voices. And for me, it went on for a long time before I decided to leave the church. But you question that because you're taught that that voice inside you, even your thoughts are sinful. Everything about you is sinful. So you don't deserve to trust yourself. You don't deserve to hear that inner voice. And if they do acknowledge that inner voice, it's usually, oh, that's Satan getting a, a, a foothold that's trying to wedge you in between your faith and your people and your community and your God. And so there's so much fear layered on top of that. And it makes it really hard not only to hear your intuition, your inner voice, but to trust it and even more so to follow it. So the next one is aim for per perfection, just like Jesus. I think we can all say that we know that there's no such thing as perfection. We all know that there's no perfection and that when you're in a high control religion and you are taught to constantly aim for the best of the best of the best and, and you're never quite getting it, you're never quite hitting the mark and everything you do that isn't hitting the mark or doesn't ally with your religious programming or doctrination um, is just, again, Satan getting in the way, your sinfulness, your sinful thoughts, and it can be so damaging, so, so damaging. And although I didn't actually fully accept Jesus into my life till I was about 13 or 14, I am so grateful that my formative years as a young child we're not steeped in this because I struggled enough. I struggled enough with not feeling loved and for self-esteem issues and just a lot of my own childhood trauma. But to feel like as a little kid that you're always aiming for perfection, be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't all try to be the best versions of ourselves. But when it's all about you're not a good being, you are bad, sinful creation from the moment you're born. And then you're just told constantly to be like this person, but that you'll never actually be like this person because you're trash. It's very confusing. So moving on to the next one. Women must submit to the authority of men. Now, I understand that different types of religions, different denominations, different areas of the world have all different societal expectations of gender norms. But I will say from my experience in America, and in the evangelical church, although some of them are not nearly as outwardly obvious that women are less than than men, it is still there. It is still a huge topic over whether women should even be allowed to teach or preach at the pulpit. It's a huge issue with women stay home and raise the children and do we believe in birth control or not? And women just being subservient to men, because the reality is all Abrahamic religions are based on patriarchy and patriarchy puts man at the top. Hence the reason that God, the father is the only thing we attribute to creation. The woman where we know life actually comes from, we are the, we are the creators of life. Life comes from our bodies was pushed out of the creation story, was pushed out of the Abrahamic religions as secondary, just a helpmate, just somebody who who's procreating the world with, with the patriarchy um, system. And so from the very beginning, women in these Abrahamic religions, and I'm sure in other areas, but my specialty is more Abrahamic religions, um, is that women are never enough. I even went, you know, to a church where the pastor literally did nothing outside of show up, preach, go home, study and write. And his wife did everything, wore every single hat at the church, wore every single hat at home. And he was kind of smugly proud of that. And it just broke my heart. And although you may not always see it, outwardly, very obviously, in some Christian um, American churches in particular, I promise you that behind closed doors, there is a lot of mistreatment from men to women, and that women should be subservient, and that we should put up with all the crap, and we should stay focused, stay committed, because that's our godly duty. Press your anger because it is sinful. Okay, this is a sticky one because I struggle with this one because um, I do tend to be an empath. Um, I'm a strong person and I can be very direct, 
but I'm also very empathic. I'm very um, aware of other people's energies and how they're feeling. And, and so it was really hard for me to stand up for myself and to have anger when it was considered righteous anger. And although I could do that for somebody I cared about, like my husband, my children, my friends, I had a really hard time doing that for me. And it's still something I, I, I struggle with because especially women in the church are meant to be quiet, to not make a fuss, to not cause others to stumble, particularly their husbands and their families. And so we are meant, we just keep getting shut down and shut down and gaslit all the time because it's sinful to be angry. And then even if you have a good reason to be angry and you it falls under the righteous anger, then it's if you don't forgive and you don't move on, then it's sin. And it's just a vicious cycle of gaslighting, especially women, but I believe it's across the board and children, um, to not trust themselves. We've already talked about that. To feel like women need to submit. We've talked about that. And to think of yourself is just imperfect and not trustworthy. And so why would you have anger if it's just based on what you think when everybody's telling you that you're wrong and that that's not how it's supposed to be and and you need to listen to your spouse or you need to listen to your pastor or the head of the church so that's a really hard thing to find that balance between righteous anger and and standing in that truth um and people saying that it's sin causing you to be angry because then it just becomes a vicious cycle of Anytime you speak up for yourself, anytime you stand up for what's right, um, that that is considered brushing up against the system and can cause a lot of chaos within the community of the church. So I would just like you to remember that it is okay to be angry. It is okay to stick up for yourself just as you would for other people. It is okay to have boundaries. It is okay to trust your inner voice. It is okay for women to stand up and take care of themselves because once you take care of yourself, you can take care of others so much better. And your children, if you have them, your relationships, your jobs, they will all balance out so much more beautifully if you stand confidently in who you are. Um, and the last one says, people pleasing behaviors in the name of love. Again, <laughs> I'm not trying to sound like a broken record, but this is very common with women um, in the church, but I do see it happening with men as well. And that is just overextending yourself all the time, always giving of yourself, deny yourself, give to others. It's Christianity and most high control religions do not consider the autonomy of the person. It's really about shutting down your desires and always thinking about others. And I'm not saying that's not a beautiful thing in theory. Take away the part that you are a beautiful creation and deserve to take care of yourself as well. You deserve love and peace in your life. You deserve to wake up happy. And if that's not happening, you need to do the work to take care of yourself before you're constantly giving to everybody else. And this people pleasing is just gaslighting yourself all the time, just trying to mask and show up in a way that you're told you should show up. So those are some areas that I wanted to talk about. So in this next slide, we're gonna go through some images I have here. The first one says, if you believed this as a kid, you might now struggle with this as an adult or where you are in your life right now. So the first one says, I'm inherently sinful. We've talked about that. We've talked about how when you are taught from the moment you're born that you are sinful, you are bad, you are really no good. Um, the only reason you're worth anything is because you believe this. And this says that if you believe it, your sins are forgiven. And that's your only worthiness. That's your only reason for anything. That's your salvation. And um, so right now as an adult, you might struggle with self-hatred and you might be like, oh, I don't hate myself, but let's let's take the words a little less harsh and say just self-dislike or lack of self-trust or lack of self-love. And that's the same thing. And that's where you're constantly questioning. I question still after 10 years leaving the church and, and studying religion, studying psychology, getting coaching certifications, working through my own religious trauma. 
I still struggle with, am I worthy? Am I worthy of love? Am I a good person? And um, it's just, when you're brought up in a system that tells you you're not all the time, it's really hard to find true love for yourself. So in the next one, it says, um, if you believe this as a kid, those who don't believe go to hell. Then right now you may be struggling with fear of being wrong. And I will say as a religious trauma coach and in this world of religious deconstruction, the biggest thing is probably what if I'm wrong and I go to hell? What if every, what if they were all right and I'm wrong? Well, first of all, I want you to know that as a, as a, as a previous Christian, an ex-evangelical, I can tell you that even when I was in the church, even when I was living the life, I was believing the stuff, I was praying, I was devoting my time, I was reading scripture, it never left my mind that what if I'm still going to go to hell? What if I'm still not good enough? How many times have most of us repeated the sinner's prayer and, and recommitted our lives again and again and again? And because what if, what if we didn't quite get it right? So I want you to remember that because humans really don't have any concrete facts about what happens after we die, um, we all have fear. We all have some fear of the unknown. That's, that's, that's humanity. That's being a human. We're conditioned for survival. So when there's something we don't know and we can't control, fear comes into it. And so I want you to realize that it's, it's not wrong to be a little fearful of what happens after death. But I do want to encourage you, if you are struggling with those thoughts, to start studying the history of hell, the history of the Bible, why hell wasn't really a thing until the New Testament, and was it even really a thing then? So I am not here to guide you through all that right now, but I encourage you after these videos to dive a little bit deeper into the realities of hell and you will be pleasantly surprised and hopefully very relieved after you do that studying. Um, the next one says, um, if you believe this as a kid, I can't trust my heart, then now you might have mistrust of self. And that goes back to trusting your own thoughts and your own intuition. Again, from day one, you are told, you cannot trust your desires. You cannot trust your intuition. You cannot trust your own thoughts because even they are sinful. So yeah, it, it be, it's, a, it's a journey to trust yourself again, to hear your voice again. It's a process. Be gentle with yourself. It takes a long time. Um, the next one is, if you believe this as a kid, sex before marriage is a sin, then right now you may have some sexual shame. And the purity movement of the 80s and 90s, that's where I came in to high control religion, um, was very damaging to not only women, but men too, to gender identities, to the natural human desire for intimacy and sexual activity and love. All of those things really got screwed up, really got some messed up um, views and terminologies and shame talk. And so that's something you could possibly be struggling in now, even if you're in a committed relationship, married maybe, and you have left the faith and you've done all this work, but there's still this underlying thing that your sexual desires are evil and wrong if they don't stay within this box. And um, again, as long as you are not hurting anybody else and you are not hurting yourself and everything is consensual and you are an adult, there should be no shame in discovering your sexuality and enjoying the pleasures of sexual activity and being with um, a partner who enjoys it as well. And I just want you to realize that this again, all of this shame that is brought in by high control religion takes time to work through. Be gentle with yourself as you are going through this. If you have a partner who's not understanding some of the sexual shame you may have, let them know that this is a very deep-rooted issue that has been um, causing a lot of problems with a lot of people coming out of high control religion and has also hurt a lot of people. Um, LGBTQ plus community, I, 
I am sorry, my heart breaks for what um, high control or super conservative religious belief systems have done to you and have done to your to that community. We are all human beings. We are all worthy of love and we are all deserving of basic human rights. And um, this has caused a lot of damage. And I think we're seeing that so much more in the world today. And so the sexual shame that comes from high control religion is deep rooted and can take a very long time. And probably you need a coach or a therapist to help you with that. Um, the next one, if you believe this as a kid, I should only think on what is pure. This goes back to always wanting, you know, be like Jesus. Even your thoughts are sinful, which I'm sorry, <laughs> but talk about emotional manipulation and confusion when there's nothing we can do about our thoughts. I mean, there are times we can train our thoughts. We can train positive thinking in some ways. We also are we're conscious beings. We're able to to look at things and think things without even realizing what we're thinking. And so to say that everything you think that isn't pure and isn't aligned with what this doctrine is teaching you is sinful and wrong, it's exhausting. And so now you might struggle with perfectionism, just feeling like you're never doing enough. You're never pure enough. You're never kind enough. You're never hardworking. And that's really difficult when you've come out of just being told all the time that you're not perfect and that you're not that good and that you're not that great. And everything you do is is praising or is giving praise to God and you shouldn't take any of it yourself. Um, the next one, you're either on fire for God or lukewarm. I think we have all experienced something along those lines. And that's another thing. So um, it says you might now struggle with being performative. And I think this kind of comes under perfectionism too, because when you're in a high control religion, how many of us who were in it or who still are in it are struggling in the morning to get out of bed on Sunday? You don't really want to go. You're frustrated. You're tired you're stressed, you're depressed, your kids are screaming, your husband's in the bathroom for an hour while you're trying to get everybody ready, and you get to church and you're screaming and you're fighting, but the minute you open those doors, bows are on, cute clothes are on, smiles, everybody's happy, we're going to go to Bible study, we're going to go to lunch with everybody afterwards, then we're going to have a Bible study at our house, so you're going to run home and clean the house so it looks perfect, and everything is about presenting what they're telling you to present. They want you to be molded into this perfect little box and perform the way the church is telling you to perform. And so you don't see a lot of authenticity. You don't see a lot of people being raw and real because it's frowned upon. It's frowned upon. And if you're struggling and you're being raw and real, quite often that's used against you. That's them saying that you're, you're, sin is causing this. You're not in alignment with God. Your heart isn't really pure. Something is keeping you. Something is attached to you. You're having spiritual warfare and so on and so on. So this whole perfectionism and being performative is suit any high control religion. So I want you to know that if you're, if you have felt those things or you do feel those things, those are all very common things. Again, it's a process. Walk through it gently with yourself. Okay, so we are moving on to what is adverse religious experiences or AREs, as you may see it referred to later on in this workshop. So any experience of a religious belief, practice, or structure that undermines an individual's sense of safety or autonomy and or negatively impacts their physical, social, emotional, relational, or psychological well-being. So the next one says, self-gaslighting is a common coping mechanism used for those indoctrinated into religious cults because it allows them to survive the mental splitting that would otherwise occur while trying to hold on to illogical, dissonant beliefs the group requires them to adopt. So in a couple of slides, we're going to be talking about cognitive dissonance and what that means. And what she's saying is that we often have that inner knowing, have that like, ooh, I can't believe that we really believe that or that the pastor really believes that or, but I really love my, my child who, who came out to me and, or I really care about my, my neighbor down the street who's, who's a different religion. And I can't understand how these people are going to hell just for being 
human and being good humans at that. And we, we gaslight ourselves and we're like, well, God's ways are not our ways. We can't possibly understand. And it says it right here in the good book. And so we tend to gaslight ourselves and over and over and over until we finally had enough. And we say, hold on, I'm trusting myself again. I'm listening to my inner voice. I'm listening to my conscience and start stepping away and looking at it from a different perspective with a critical thinking brain, which we will talk about more in the second. Video. Okay, so on this slide, we are going to talk about the power and, and control wheel in high control religions. Now, I am not going to read through all of this. I'm just going to um, read through each category, but I will include this in the worksheets. And I highly encourage you to print it out and read through it and see how deep all of this stuff really goes. So the first. Um, Part of the wheel um, says isolation. The next one is minimizing, denying, and blame. The next one is emotional abuse, then spiritual abuse, then threats, accusations, and intimidation, economic control, sexuality and gender defining, and loss of autonomy. This was by Lauren Anderson, and she's part of the Religious Trauma Institute, and she created this. She is a psychiatrist, and she um, created this based on the domestic abuse wheel that it looks very similar. And instead, she added um, high control religion and where that falls into all of the categories that have you, um, again, peel back the layers with an open mind and heart and remember to be gentle and loving to yourself. So in this one, um, it says the most common reasons people leave high control religion. Yeah, I'll show some, some areas to explore, whether they resonate with your own reasons or somebody else you might know. So the first one is doctrinal disagreements. Individuals may come to disagree with or question the teachings, doctrines, or practices of their high control religion. Um, this abuse or exploitations. Experience of abuse, whether it's emotional, psychological, physical, or sexual manipulation, coercion, as in you have free will, but you can only choose between eternal hell or eternal worship of said God, reward or, or exploitation within the religious group, um, cognitive and, dissonance, um, discrepancies between the beliefs promoted by the religion and observed reality can cause cognitive dissonance, leading individuals to reevaluate their involvement of said religious organizations. This is one that um, is very common when what you see being lived out is different than what you hear being preached or what you see in science and history and archaeology is different than what you're being told. It takes a long time for those two things to line up where you're able to now see that not everything you believed was true. And it's really, really a painful experience in some ways. And although um, it can be very freeing once you've gone through the process, it can be really painful to to see all the things that you were led to believe that that didn't quite line up, that you didn't know why, and you did you were too scared to question it, and, and now you find some answers to those questions that the church was never able to answer for you. Um, desire for autonomy. HCRs often restrict individual autonomy, and for many, for many, leave in the pursuit of personal freedom and independence. And the next and one, we're going to so, continue on um, seeking authenticity. Individuals may may leave in search of a more authentic or genuine spiritual experience, feeling that high control environment is artificial and insincere. Um, Intellectual now, exploration, further. engaging in critical thinking, education, or exposure to diverse perspectives can lead individuals to question and ultimately leave their high control religions. Um, emotional or psychological distress. The emotional toll of belonging to an HCR, such as anxiety, depression, or trauma, may prompt individuals to seek healthier environments. Um, the Again, next one is ethical or moral concerns. Conflicts with ethical or moral values promoted by HERs can cause individuals to leave in search of alignments with their own principles. In the next slide, um, we are going to talk about cognitive dissonance, which we have mentioned a few times in the video already, and this is going to give you a little more deep dive into what it means. Cognitive dissonance is the mental conflict that occurs when beliefs are contradicted by new information. 
This conflict activates areas of the brain involved in personal identity and emotional response to threats, such as the insula and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The brain's alarm goes off when a person feels threatened on a deeply personal and emotional level, causing them to shut down and disregard any rational evidence that contradicts what they previously regarded as truth. This is why people get upset when their beliefs are challenged. Most people have a strong confirmation bias built into their mindset, causing them to seek everything that confirms their beliefs and repels anything that does not.